Nancy, you're such a voice for us when it comes to artificial intelligence, whether it's hype or reality. And I'm interested as to whether you think the second half will bode well if you're long some of these names like NVIDIA and the chip stocks. Well, look, trees don't grow to the sky, so we need to recognize that these stocks have run a lot uh, already. Uh, having said that, you know, NVIDIA's got a lot of its leave in terms of new product development, right? We've got uh, Blackwell coming on in 2025. Uh, we've got uh, Ruben uh, thereafter. Uh, and so there's quite a lot of product development. Uh, NVIDIA does enjoy a competitive moat in both software uh, and hardware. And, and I think we're just beginning uh, of the purchase of these, uh, these GPU chips from governments uh, and other sectors like healthcare, uh, the automotive sector. Uh, so look, uh, at the end of the day, when a stock has risen 150%, uh, there can always be a pullback. Uh, but I would say we're still pretty early uh, innings here uh, on the NVIDIA story. Nancy, we've done a lot on the show of late about how difficult it is, particularly for the sell side, to forecast top line growth. You talked about Blackwell coming online. But you're in the camp of people that says Gen AI is going to change everything, but it's not yet priced in. Uh, which sectors is it not yet priced in for? Where is that not yet being reflected? Well, I think given what we've seen uh, in the first quarter and the second quarter, uh, in particular the United States, the second quarter all led uh, by the magnificent five, so to speak. You know, mm -hmm. Apple and Tesla obviously lagged a bit, uh, but it was tech, tech and tech. And so I would say that Gen AI has been priced in to a certain extent to those stocks. They certainly are recognized uh, as Gen AI beneficiaries. But I think the interesting thing uh, is, um, you know, Gen AI is value added across every sector of the economy, or at least that's what we think. Uh, and therefore, looking ahead, uh, we think Gen AI and its implications for innovation, cost savings, productivity improvements in other parts of the economy uh, is not yet priced in. And in any event, our view uh, is that earnings growth will broaden and deepen as the year progresses. It's still about tech in the second quarter, by the way, but as the year progresses, uh, and we think that will lead to a broadening uh, in market participation. So actually, many of our managers, remember, we're open architecture at Alti Tiedemann, uh, have been reducing uh, technology to the benefit to other sectors of the economy that will over time benefit from Gen AI. But also, uh, we think we'll see an acceleration in earnings growth as the year progresses and, frankly, uh, trade on a more attractive valuation. Really important when it comes to publicly traded equities, Nancy. But what's so great about you is we can go cross-asset as well and to private assets and to non-public companies. It's interesting, we on recently had Yummer Crossing Capital Advisors head on recently who've done a partnership with Alti Tiedemann to look at, well, private companies from an equity perspective, but you're looking at it from a debt perspective as well. Where should one be allocating into technology or more broadly? So um, in technology and more broadly, let's just take private credit by way of example. Uh, we think private credit is super interesting because there's a retrenchment happening on the part of the banks. Now, you all saw the stress test last week. Banks need more capital. Uh, Basel III will be punitive uh, in terms of ongoing capital requirements. There's mark-to-market pressures uh, on bank balance sheets. Uh, and of course, small to medium-sized banks, uh, commercial banks uh, that have uh, very high exposure to the commercial real estate uh, sector have been withdrawing from lending, not to mention funding costs going up. Okay, so what's happening here? Banks are retrenching from lending, uh, but marquee credit names uh, are coming in and filling uh, the void. Uh, we initially invested uh, in what are called private lending, direct lending strategies. More recently, uh, we're evolving and moving into what I call asset-backed lending strategies. Again, these are kind of almost investment grade or in another name investment grade, senior secured, high up in the capital structure, uh, and direct lending is about a 2% premium uh, to high yield, uh, whereas asset-backed lending is about a 4% uh, premium to high yield. And, and by the way, these are being okay. offered uh, to wealth channels in sort of semi-liquid form. So it's not hugely illiquid, and that's important as well. Nancy, how is a presidential election in the United States going to impact the technology sector? Wow. Well, the presidential election in the United States got rather entertaining uh, last Thursday in a sort of cringe 
uh, way, dare I say. Uh, you know, we've got a long way to go here. Uh, before we know uh, whether either candidate or uh, obviously if there's a replacement for Biden remains to be seen. Uh, but look, I think tech companies remain strong. Neither candidate is anti-tech. They both recognize this is a significant competitive advantage uh, to the United States. I don't see IRA or the CHIPS Act being rolled back under either candidate, clearly uh, not if President Biden uh, wins. And these are all important uh, supports for the tech sector. Um, that, in addition to the fact that these technology companies, uh, you know, are spending huge amounts uh, on Gen AI, $200 billion, the four largest tech companies, of course, their CapEx is uh, NVIDIA's revenue. Uh, and so we, we think that continues irrespective of who wins the election. Now, this is a sector that's not really impacted by the election. This is a real secular trend here.